All right, well, good morning and welcome everyone to Congregational Bible Church of Shafter, our Sunday morning service on January 17th, 2021. Welcome to all of you who are here in person and welcome to all of you tuning in and watching at home. We're glad you're with us this morning. Uh, we're going to sing and worship our Lord as we begin, but I want to read you some scripture to call us to do that. So let's stand together. This is Psalm 100, the first two verses. It says, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. So let's sing to Him this morning.
faithful forever god is strong forever god is with us forever forever god is faithful forever god is strong forever god is with us forever and ever step of faith, every sacrifice, every prayer that's prayed from an honest heart. You alone deserve every breath of worship. I just want to say how great you are. And it's all for you. Every song of praise is all for you. Every hand that's raised, everything I am, everything I do, is all for you, all for you. I want to let you know you are my hero I'm a grateful soul that's been redeemed all creation sees all the earth adores you from the highest star to the deepest sea and it's all for you every song of praise is all for you every hand that's raised everything i am everything i do is all for you all for you and it's all for you every song of praise is all for you every hand that's raised everything i am everything i do is all for you all for you and it's all Oh 
glory fills the skies. Your mighty works displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to see. How marvelous, how wonderful you are, beautiful one, I love, beautiful one, I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing, beautiful one, I love, beautiful one, I adore, beautiful one, my soul must sing. Yes, we, we sing that and we, we pray that, Lord, as well, that through our songs and through our prayers and through our uh, preaching and hearing of the word this morning, that you would be exalted, Lord, and, and not us, Lord, but you, and that the, 
this community, this people, this country, this world, um, Lord, would know the name of Jesus Christ and they would know who He is and what He has done. And so, Lord, it's our desire uh, that You be uh, exalted above all things, Lord, this morning. And we pray in our Savior's name and all the church said, Amen. Amen. We want to welcome you again uh, to our service here on January 17th. We're already midway through January, if you can believe it. This year is flying by already, but... Um, it's great to see all of you. Go ahead and give a wave to all those around you. You can wave to the camera. Hello, people at home. <laughs> uh, we, miss, we miss those days, don't we? We miss those days of, of hugs and earnest handshakes and all that good stuff that we used to do in fellowship, but uh, we are just praying for everybody to be safe and healthy. And, um, so go ahead and grab your bulletins as we've got some announcements to go over. Uh, Last Wednesday, we began a new study, a new sort of theological study about the spiritual realm, which is a study of angels and demons and Satan and spiritual warfare and all that good stuff. So we began last week by looking at uh, what angels are. What exactly is an angel? That's what we covered last Wednesday. You can always go back and watch the video on YouTube for that. But this Wednesday, we'll cover like, what do angels do? What's their purpose? What's their job? What's their role? That's what we're going to talk about this Wednesday. Um, Youth group is still meeting on Wednesdays as well. They meet in the parlor right now, uh, so all the junior high and high schoolers can make note of that. Um, The Thursday morning ladies also, they met last week, last Thursday, and they had such a good time spending time with each other. They said, we're going to do it again this week. So uh, I know originally we had said once a month, but the ladies on Thursday morning said, no, we, we need to be with each other weekly. So all the ladies there, the Thursday morning ladies, please make note of that. They'll be meeting this Thursday. I think it's the 21st that they'll be meeting. Um, we do have on the wall here in the hallway the church directory up there. We like to put that up once a year and just ask people, you know, if you changed your phone number or email address or if you moved or you want to write your email address down or whatever, uh, just check that out. If you're watching at home, um, please send any changes you have uh, to the secretary at CBC Shafter. Just email that in and and we can make those changes. We just want everybody to have updated uh, information. We're also still doing, in a way, uh, greeting in the back. You can sign up to greet in the back. Um, you can sign up to do coffee fellowship, as long as they're kind of individually wrapped things. Um, you can also sign up for sanctuary flowers. So there's other ways that you can continue to serve, even though a lot of things are not happening. Um, the big announcement, of course, is the annual meeting is the 31st. And we'll have that a little after church, about 12.30 or so. Um, Give us time to get set up and all that for that. Um, But if you're at home and you're not planning on attending in person and you would like an annual report mailed to you as well as a ballot, we can do that. You just have to let us know. We will get that to you. Uh, The annual reports are done. They are here uh, in the fellowship hall. There's some in the back as well. We have some in the church office. So if you'd want to come by the church office, if you want us to drop it off to you, whatever it is, uh, we want to get those annual reports in your hands, so you have those before the meeting. But of course, if you take uh, a ballot uh, before the meeting, it needs to be in by uh, Friday, by Friday the 29th. So make note of that if you're getting it uh, through the mail-in. There's a couple of youth announcements. Uh, they're going to have a Nerf night here at the church on January 22nd. That's in the evening, 7 to 10 p.m. All youth group can make note of that. And they're planning a snow day on January 30th. They'll get more details for that as that gets closer, but those are some uh, youth announcements that are coming up. I think those are all of our announcements, so what we're going to do is I'm going to invite Clark Gehring to come up, and he's going to lead us in scripture and prayer, and then we will sing our hymn, Ferris, Lord Jesus. So here comes Clark. Our scripture reading this morning is uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 through 3, or chapter 2. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be dis- disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as it from us 
to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Shall we pray? Dear Father God, we thank you that we can come together to give you worship and praise. We thank you that we can come, be it in church or in our homes, and that we have the freedom to worship. We thank you for the technology that exists so that no matter where we are, you're never far from us. We thank you for the wonderful weather that we're having so that we can observe your grandeur through nature. We ask that you be with those that are suffering of illnesses that are, that are present around us. May those have, that have the virus and other ailments find peace and comfort during this time. May we overcome the pain and suffering either in us or around us. Help our world to defeat the evils around us. During this week, when we and the world focus on our country's presidential inauguration, may we have peace and comfort knowing you're in control of our nation and our lives and that all things are under your control and that no matter what, we're still to follow Jesus. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, you stated, And my people who are called by my name humble myself, them, if they humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We want this to be our prayer also. We want our land healed and our sins forgiven. We want to seek you as a people and nation so that you will hear our prayers, forgiving our sins as either a nation and people so that our land is healed. In Psalms 103, 115, David stated, As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes. But when the wind comes and passes over it, it is no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Therefore, our life on earth is short and the things that were and are important in the past and present should not be a concern for today. But by trusting in the Lord and having faith in him, it's everlasting and eternal. Amen. Now would you please stand and join us as we sing Fairest Lord Jesus in your hymn books. It's number 240. Oh, uh-huh. 
sunshine fair as still the moonlight and all the twinkling starry hosts Jesus shines brighter shines purer all the angels there can boast beautiful Savior Lord of all the nations be seated. It's good singing. It's good to hear God's people singing together. I know you're singing at home, but we enjoy to enjoy hearing the voices of, of the saints uh, proclaiming Jesus the Lord of the nations, right? I love that. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As our elder Clark read earlier, chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. If you're using a Pew Bible, I think it's page 1185 in the Pew Bible, 1185. 2 Thessalonians 2, as we get to really the, the heart of the letter, the heart of the matter for why 2 Thessalonians was written. It is interesting, over the past year or two, we've heard two new phrases become more and more popular in our culture. It's sort of become part of the vernacular. Two phrases, fact-checking and fake news. Fact-checking is the research into claims made by individuals or groups to see if they're true or not, to see if they're accurate. And fake news is the name given to reports or stories that are not true or are biased or not objective. And it's interesting how both of those phrases go together. They sort of relate to one another, right? Someone can call a report fake news, and then someone else will go and fact-check that claim to see if it actually is fake news or not. But we do want the truth, don't we? When we go to the doctor, we want him to tell us the truth. When we go to the mechanic, we say, tell us the truth about my car. And although our culture claims that truth is relative and truth is subjective, interestingly, they agree with things like fact-checking. Fact-checking and fake news, if you think about it, both presuppose that objective truth is out there and is real and it can be known. Information should be truthful. Information should not be fake, and it should not go against fact. And that may be true in other areas of the world, but it is especially true in the matters of theology as well. We need to have our theology be correct. We cannot believe the fake news of wrong theology. 
And all the time we should be fact-checking the theological information we receive to make sure it's true. I remember a number of months ago, a, a challenge or... Like I think they call them challenges, was, was circulating through Facebook world, and it was something that you are supposed to copy and paste on your page and share amongst as many people as you can. And this particular one, there's many that go around, this particular one caught my eye because it began with this statement, I know the Antichrist comes before the rapture. Now when I thought about it, I said, well, that's interesting because that is a theological statement. That's what caught my eye about it. An eschatological statement, an end time statement. And there, it is true that there are many good and godly people who believe that. That the rapture comes at the end. That we go through the rapture and at the very, I mean we get through the tribulation and at the very end comes the rapture. So we will deal with all the implications of the Antichrist. But there are people who believe that the rapture happens before that. That the rapture happens at the beginning. And that the church will not be present when the Antichrist takes his leadership. And when you think about both of those two views, they can't both be right. They could both be wrong, but they can't both be right. One says the rapture happens here, one says it happens here. And those are two completely opposite things. And so we have to figure out which is true. When it comes to our theology, we've got to figure that out. Which one's right? We need to be correct about what we believe about God and the Bible. And I'll admit, it gets really hard when it comes down to eschatology. When it comes down to end times theology, it's really hard. Because there are so many views, and there are so many good and godly people who hold all those particular views... But that doesn't mean that we just kind of throw up our hands in exasperation and say, whoa, oh, well, who knows? We still have to try to seek to be correct, but it takes work. And what we have to do is we have to fact check what we hear and what we believe about our theology. Even when it comes to the areas of end times. And in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, we get to really the heart of the epistle, the heart of the matter. The meat of the letter, you could say. The reason for writing. And the people of the church were disturbed in their faith because they had heard wrong theology. And they were starting to believe this wrong theology. And what Paul does in chapter 2 is he corrects it. He says, no, that's wrong. This is the actual truth. And he needs to correct it, not because he wants to just prove them wrong. It's for their comfort. It's for their encouragement. And what he does in the first three verses here of chapter 2 is he, he fact-checks the fake news they had received. And what he'll do throughout chapter 2 is he will go on further to explain more eschatological issues. But he wants in the first three verses to make sure you've got the truth here about the day of the Lord. And what we get to do as we read this passage is we get to can do the same thing that Paul does. We can do the same in our theology. We can fact check what we believe to make sure it's true, to make sure it's accurate, to make sure we don't believe the fake news of bad theology. You say, okay, well, how do we do that? Well, in this text, there's three ways that you can fact check your theology to make sure it's correct. And the first is this, to be aware of potential error. Be aware of potential error. And as I said, Paul wants their theology to be correct. It needs to be right. And what they were currently believing was wrong. It was in error. And yes, it is possible to be wrong. I know it is like the the, hor the horrible sin of today to tell somebody that they are wrong. But Paul comes out and tells the Thessalonians, you are wrong. There is a right, and there is a wrong, there is a truth, and there is error, even in the area of theology. And you can be wrong, and I can be wrong. And you know what? The Thessalonians were wrong. And really, what was happening was they were believing the wrong information they were receiving. 
And we'll see, as Paul kind of says, like, look, notice verse 5, like, don't you remember? While I was with you, I was telling you these things. Like, Paul's like, come on, like, this is not what I told you. And you say, okay, well, what is it they were in error about? Well, let's look at this. It says in verse 1, we request of you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. You have, you have two things, but they are grouped together by one conjunction. And in the original language, that means we're talking about one thing. It's not two separate things. It's one thing. The coming, the presence is literally the word, the presence of Jesus and our gathering to him. That one moment. What is that? That is the rapture where Jesus appears and Jesus gathers his church to himself. This is the particular topic he is talking about. And he tells them in verse 2, I don't want you to be quickly shaken from your composure or to be disturbed about what? Look at the end of verse 2. That the, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord is not an actual 24-hour day. It is a summary of the end times period including the tribulation, the final judgments, the coming of Christ, all of that is, is contained within the day of the Lord. So something that they had heard about the day of the Lord was causing their view of the rapture to be messed up. They were disturbed about it. And what had happened is they had come to believe wrongly by perpetrators of false theology, as we'll see later, they had been told that the day of the Lord, verse 2, the day of the Lord has come. Not is soon, not is on the horizon, but is going on now. You are in it. That's what they were hearing. This is the end times. And so if that was true, how is that related to the rapture? Well, that means that they missed it. And now you understand why they would be so disturbed and why they would be shaken. We'll talk more about that as we go. But false teachers had told them, this is the day of the Lord. And if you remember the situation of the church, they were suffering, right? They were going through a lot of persecution. They were going through a lot of tribulation. And so in a way, it kind of makes sense for someone to come along and be like, don't you understand all this tribulation you're going through? This is the end. This is God's final judgment. It's here. You are in it. And this was upsetting their faith, especially the faith that they had in the rapture that Jesus would rescue his church from this final wrath because now they're thinking, we missed it. Or even worse, it didn't happen. Paul tells them, no, that view is wrong. You guys are wrong. You are not in the day of the Lord. And so he tells them that their view, what they're believing, is in error. You are in error about this. Why? How does Paul know this? Well, he says in verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. That is a reference to the day of the Lord. It will not come unless these two things happen first. The apostasy and the man of lawlessness is Revealed. So Paul says, I can tell you you're not in the day of the Lord because these two things haven't happened yet. What are they? Well, the apostasy. The apostasy. The widespread falling away from the Christian faith. That's what apostasy is. Where a large number of so-called Christians turn their back on the Lord and abandon the church. And Jesus warned about that in Matthew 24, verse 10... In the Olivet Discourse, his discourse about the end times, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 10. At that time, the, the final time, the day of the Lord, many will fall away and they will betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Massive deception will lead many astray in the time of the day of the Lord. And it makes sense. You can understand why there would be massive deception if the entire church of Jesus Christ had been raptured from the earth and there were no longer any believers left. Deception would run wild. He says there's going to be a pervasive abandonment of Christianity in the day of the Lord. You guys should know this, Paul says. 
And that wasn't happening as Paul writes this. Remember, they were suffering a lot of tribulation. They were suffering a lot of hardship. But they were persevering. They were enduring. They were doing well. There's no apostasy happening. You're not in the day of the Lord. And the other thing that needs to happen to show that you're in the day of the Lord is the man of lawlessness needs to be revealed. The man of lawlessness or the son of destruction. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the Antichrist. And we know he's talking about that as we'll go through next time. Verses 4 through 12, he describes the career of this person known as the man of lawlessness and all that he does and all that he, uh, you could say, accomplishes. And it coincides with the other descriptions of the Antichrist in other places of the Bible. He is the man of lawlessness, which means he is known by his lawless behavior with, in regards to the law of God. Does not keep the law of God at all. He is a son of destruction. That just means he is destined for it. He is destined for destruction. That's what son of means. And so while there are many who come in the spirit of the Antichrist, teaching false teaching and things like that, the actual Antichrist will be revealed in the day of the Lord. He will rise to power. He will be a historical figure, energized and indwelt by Satan himself. And this person will have a key role in the end time. So he is an eschatological person. And as we said next time, we'll begin looking at verses 4 through 12, where Paul describes exactly what this Antichrist will do. And so you have this passage here. The Antichrist is also described in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 11. Describe this Antichrist. Revelation chapter 6 describes his rise to power through a peaceful takeover. The world embraces him. The world looks to him as, as a world leader, a world unifier. And he brings, of course, peace to Israel. And halfway through the tribulation period, he breaks the treaty with Israel. He turns on Israel and basically becomes a murderous dictator. And you see it through verses 4 through 12. He exalts himself in verse 4. He is restrained in verse 6, but then that restraint will be taken out of the way. Then verse 8, he will be revealed and the Lord eventually will slay him with the breath of his mouth. Verse 9, he comes in accord with the activity of Satan with power and signs and false wonders, with deception of wickedness, verse 10. And people will believe it, in verse 11. But you get back to our point here. Paul is telling them, stop, stop freaking out that you miss the rapture that you're in the day of the Lord. Stop being disturbed. This is not the day of the Lord. I know that for a fact, Paul says, because these two things haven't happened yet. So your current theological belief is incorrect and it needs to be changed. And we need to learn from this as well. That my theological positions and your theological positions may be subject to error. In fact, we could probably all admit, I know I'm wrong somewhere, I just don't know where it is yet. As I study and learn and grow, hopefully more will be revealed to me. And that's why we study, that's why we listen, that's why we want to read. I want to be as correct as possible because theological error is real. And as we'll see at the end, it has real effects on people's faith and on their lives. When I come to a passage like this, a very difficult passage, as admittedly so, I even get books from people that I don't agree with and I want to read their positions to see how they came to their conclusions because I want to see if their arguments are persuasive or not. The concern is the Christian who has no concern over his theology. The ones who just kind of assume, yeah, I'm right in all things that I believe, never really looked into it, never really studied it, never looked at the opposite side, don't really make sure, don't know where the Bible teaches it. I just kind of have this theological grid that someone told me somewhere and I just keep it forever. And there's no sensitivity to that possible error. You could be in error. 
The Thessalonians were. And they were taught by the Apostle Paul himself. And the other people to be concerned about are the people who just accept everything in the name of Jesus. Accept everything. And they've never considered the possibility there could be error there. They've never taken that into account. That there might be false teachers, even as we'll see in just a moment. That's why we have to know what we believe and make sure it comes from Scripture. Make sure you can back it up with Scripture. Make sure it is faithful to the context of Scripture. It's not just a verse kind of thrown out there. Because the potential for error is real. And Paul corrects their erroneous theology. The second way you can fact check your theology is to be alert to phony enthusiasts. Be alert to phony enthusiasts. And as we see in this text, a person or persons were pushing this wrong theology on the Thessalonians. They looked like Christian teachers. They sounded like them too. Sounded like they had a passionate interest in eschatology, a passionate interest in the return of Jesus. But they were phony. They weren't really interested in the end times at all. They were really interested in messing with the Thessalonians and upsetting their faith, telling them wrong information. You say, where do you see that? Well, in verse 2. We don't want you to be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit, a message, or a letter as if from us. So there were three deceptive measures being deployed by these false teachers to try to trick the Thessalonians into thinking that you're in the day of the Lord. This is the, this is the final moments. What are those three measures? He says, first, a spirit. A spirit. It's the word prophecy. And so what that means is someone was coming to them and saying, I have a word of the Lord. How do you argue with that, right? Hmm. God told me. This is the end. You're in the day of the Lord. And I just love the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says, well, I can compare your word of the Lord with what I know from other places in Scripture, and it doesn't jive. You're wrong. It's not a word of the Lord. But they also came with a message, a message, which is literally uh, the word word, which means some sort of uh, verbal sermon, if you will, some sort of verbal teaching that the people had listened to. As if someone said, I've got a word of the Lord, and then they explained exactly what that is. But the third deceptive measure they were using was a letter. And this is the most devious of all because look closely. It says, or a letter as if from us. What does that mean? Someone was writing a letter, signing it from being the Apostle Paul. And it wasn't from him. So someone coming to the church and saying, here you go. This is a letter from Paul. It says you're in the day of the Lord. See? Signed his name on it. A counterfeit letter. That's why he tells him in verse 15. Stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or mouth or a letter from us. Make sure it's a letter from us. How would they know, right? If you got a letter and it was signed by Paul, how would you know that it was really by Paul? Well, who delivered the letter? Was it one of Paul's closest associates? Because those are the only people he trusted with delivering letters. Clearly, this letter probably was not. It's from some stranger or from some guy they don't know very well. Don't accept it as being really from Paul. Who signed it? Now, maybe it has Paul's signature at the bottom. Look carefully at the chapter 3, verse 17. Look at this. Look how he ends the letter. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. It's not just signing the name. It's Paul saying, this is definitely from me. And of course, what does the letter say? Is it consistent with Paul's teachings? Is it consistent with everywhere else in Scripture, with the rest of the Word? And obviously this fake letter was not because it diverged from Paul's teaching about the rapture and the day of the Lord. It didn't fit with what he taught. But this is how we know that these enthusiasts were not just oops in error. They were malicious because they wrote a letter and signed Paul's name on it. A forged letter. 
And we know they're malicious because he says in verse 3, let no one deceive you. Someone's trying to trick you. This was not my letter. You see, this isn't just coming to someone else and going, okay, well, let's just agree to disagree about what we believe about theology. This is saying, no, this is wrong. They are trying to influence your faith. They're telling you bad theology on purpose. They want you upset. And to some extent, it had worked because they were starting to believe it. And so we need to stop being so naive. Everything labeled Christian is wonderful and profitable and true. There are wolves in sheep's clothing out there, are there not? Be alert. Be alert because there's phony enthusiasts out there who are going to try to lead you astray. Not all of them are that way, but some are. And so you need to be alert. And thirdly, the third way you can fact check your theology, be attentive to powerful effects. Be attentive to powerful effects. Through all these statements of truth and error, wrong and right, Paul's main goal is not that the people would look at him and go, oh man, he's so smart. Wow, look at him. He can win a theological argument. Wow, he's got all the answers. No. His one concern through all of this was a pastoral concern. Because look at verse 1 again. Now we request you, brethren. Request? He's like, I'm making a request, and eventually as you read on, that you do not be disturbed by this. A request? That's not really any type of harsh insult. Don't you know you're wrong? It's a passionate concern he has for them, right? Listen, brothers, brothers and sisters of Thessalonica, I'm requesting of you to not be led astray. And what's the, the deep concern that he has for them? The, the concern is the effects upon their faith. If you follow this wrong information about the rapture in the day of the Lord, you will end up being shaken and disturbed. Look at the words there in verse 2. We don't want you to be quickly shaken from your composure, from your mind. Quickly shaken. The word shaken means unsettled, like, a, like an earthquake, like a storm has, has moved you. And sometimes the word was used of a, of a ship that had been pushed and come loose of its moorings and was drifting away. And it's not a slow process. It's quickly shaken. We don't want you to be quickly moved away from what you believe. And the other word there in verse 2, or to be disturbed, disturbed, it's, it's the word for alarmed, frightened, scared. We don't want you to be in fear. And to put it in layman's terms, can we just say it like this? The Thessalonians were freaking out. They were an emotional wreck. Because Paul had taught them the rapture is going to happen at any time, at any moment, and now someone else is telling them, no, you're in the day of the Lord. And as I said before, I'll say it again. What did that mean to them? That means you missed the rapture or, or it never happened, which is an even bigger problem. Would that cause you to freak out? Probably. What they knew, their entire belief system about how things were going to unfold, it was unraveling and it was causing them to panic. It was upsetting their faith. Paul said we get raptured at any moment before the day of the Lord. And the phony enthusiast, no, 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 no. This is the day of the Lord. You're in it. Does false theology have an effect on people's faith? Of course it does. And this is Paul's concern. I don't want you to be shaken and disturbed. He's worried about the effects on their faith. And by the way, I tend to think that this passage clearly shows that Paul taught them a rapture that happens before the tribulation. And let me explain why. Because why else would their faith be upset? If Paul had taught them, hey guys, remember, you're going to go through this horrible tribulation, and at the very end of the tribulation, you know, the whole Antichrist being an evil world dictator, after you go through all that, then you get raptured. If that's what he had taught them, then if they had been told, you're now in the day of the Lord, they wouldn't be panicking, they would be rejoicing. 
saying, whew, the end is near. Count down the days. Any moment, Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah, this is it. That's not what's happening. They're losing it. Because Paul had taught them the rapture comes first, then the day of the Lord. And they were disturbed that wasn't working. Some say, well, wait a second. This passage actually teaches a rapture at the end of the tribulation. It teaches a rapture at the end of the tribulation because Paul tells them to look for these signs, doesn't he? The apostasy, the revealing of the man of lawlessness, then you're in the day of the Lord, then comes the rapture. Why doesn't Paul say, you know what, don't worry about it, you're not going to be here anyway. Don't we just want him to say that? Don't worry about it. Is he telling them to look for these two signs and then they'll know that they're in the day of the Lord? No, he's not. He's explaining why the view that you are in the day of the Lord is wrong. It's wrong because these two things haven't happened yet. Not that they're going to go through it. And remember, the entire theme of this section is pastoral. It's, I want you comforted. I don't want you to be disturbed. Notice verse 17, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. The idea is he wants them comforted. It's very hard for me to find out how it would bring them any comfort to tell them this. Don't worry, don't worry. This isn't all that bad. The Antichrist is coming. How would that bring you any comfort? It would bring you comfort to say, you're not there yet. These things haven't happened. Stop panicking. You didn't miss the rapture. It's still coming. Relax. The point is, incorrect theology, false teaching, has real-world effects on people's faith. And you see it in situations like this for the Thessalonians. This wrong eschatology was upsetting their composure and their faith. And i got to tell you, you've seen it in other areas as well. For example, some people teach and some people will say that the Lord heals every time. The Lord's will is always to heal. And I remember one young lady, a young mom, she was diagnosed with a form of cancer. And all of her friends and family who told her, no, it's God's will to heal. God will always heal. And they prayed for that healing. And then she died. And you say, what kind of effect does that have on someone's faith? You see, we have to get our theology right. We've got to make sure. We might not be able to be 100% positive of everything. There may be people that we disagree with. But hopefully, with solid study and teaching, we can hold on to the truths we believe firmly. Because what we believe has powerful effects in the real world, especially if there are phony enthusiasts trying to lead us astray. And the concern always has to be not trying to look smarter than others, not trying to win an argument, but that our faith would be firm and we would not be shaken and disturbed. And so this is how we fact check our theology, how we make sure it's not fake news. You need to be aware of potential error. Yes, you and I, we can be wrong in some of the things that we believe. But we better try to get it right. You need to know what you believe, and you need to be able to back it up with Scripture. I love how Paul corrects it. Paul appeals to the words of Jesus and to what he knows of the Old Testament. Jesus said the apostasy would come. That hasn't happened yet. Matthew 24. The man of lawlessness must be revealed. He's prophesied in Daniel 7, Daniel 9, and Daniel 11. Your view is wrong because it does not jive with the rest of Scripture. That's what Paul does. We need to be alert to phony enthusiasts. You know, I got a book over Christmas break I really wanted to read. It was about the most common, the most common Hebrew words in the Old Testament and how they relate to the Christian's life. And I thought, oh, this will be a good refresher about Hebrew. And what the author does in the book is he tells, he talks about how the Old Testament stories, mostly early in the book of Genesis, Cain, Abel, Adam and Eve, all those, all those stories aren't true. Those are fictional they didn't really happen. They're just, they're just legends that are supposed to teach us a lesson. 
stories. And I just wonder, like, when, when does the Old Testament become actual and factual? If chapter 1 isn't, chapter 2 isn't, chapter 3 isn't, chapter 4, not really. Chapter 6, about that whole crazy flood. No, that didn't really happen. How about chapter 12, that guy named Abraham? Did that really happen? How about Joseph? How about the time in Egypt? How about the Day of Atonement? How about the Passover? Does that all happen? Or are those just legends as well? You know, and I'm, so, I, I'm disappointed because I think that, that's incorrect. Cain and Abel were not real people. Yes, they were. You know why? Because in the book of Luke, when it gives the genealogy of Jesus, it takes them all the way back to Adam. Is that wrong? Now, I don't think the author is trying to maliciously deceive, but the reality is some are. Some are. And be attentive to those powerful effects that wrong theology can have. You start being led astray, it's going to affect you. That's why it's important to get it right. And so fact-checking our theology, it doesn't mean that we go around and try to start theological arguments with everybody we come in contact with. No, but I want to know the truth. I want to be sure of what the Bible teaches. I want to be sure of what I believe, as sure as I can be. It may not be 100%, but if it's based on good study, comparing Scripture together, then we can be sure. Pray with me as we close our time. Father, it's so important to get things right. And Lord, um, there are matters of theology that are of the most importance, especially when we think about your son, Lord, and we understand that there are, there are groups and there are cults who do not believe the right teachings about Jesus, Lord. And we would, we would say that they have, they have strayed from Orthodox Christianity and are no longer even able to be called Christians. And Lord, when it comes to eschatology, maybe it's not as serious as the fundamentals of our belief system, Lord, but still it is your word, and you gave your word to be understood, and you gave your word to reveal the truth. And so, Lord, we have a responsibility to try to know what we believe and, and to get it right. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be passionate students of your word, that we would seek to know your scripture carefully and, and rightly and truthfully. That we would know what we believe. That we would be able to defend why. And we wouldn't just shrug our shoulders and say, I don't know, that's a hard topic. I'll just, I'll just give up. Father, your word is powerful and your word is true and your word has real-world effects on faith. It can bolster and strengthen and hold our faith. Or, Lord, wrong theology, false teaching can affect our faith negatively. So, Lord, I pray that we would be on guard. I pray that we would be alert. We would be aware. We would be attentive. And I pray for the serious study of Scripture amongst your people. Lord, and we ask all of this in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And with that, we will dismiss this morning and we will see you next time.